Today is October 27th, 2021, and my guest is author and neuroscientist Nina Krauss of Northwestern University. Her book and the subject of today's conversation is Of Sound Mind, How Our Brain Constructs a Meaningful Sonic World. Nina, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, thank you, Russ. And I think you can hear from the sound of my voice how happy I am to be talking to you. <laughs> this is an utterly fascinating book on a huge part of our daily life that we rarely think about and often don't fully perceive, which is the role of sound in our lives, music, language, everything else that makes noise, how we hear those sounds, how the brain is shaped by them, and in turn, how the brain shapes how we hear. I want to start with uh, the importance of sound because, as you point out in the book, a lot of people would list it a little bit down the list of their favorite senses. They'd say, eh, seeing, that's crucial. I'd be, I'd hate to be blind, but deaf, I, you know, I could live with it if I had, you know, it's not as important as seeing. And, and I think we, never, we don't, hardly ever think about it until we lose our sense of hearing, in which case uh, we do think about it or, or if we're deaf. But I think that one of the themes of your book is that we greatly undervalue the importance of sound. And, and we only think of it as, oh, that's hearing stuff. I get that. I know what I hear. I like to hear things. But it's so much more profound than that. And I think one of the great uh, insights of the book for, for a non-auditory uh, scientist as you are is to appreciate it. So why do we undervalue the importance of sound? Yeah. Well, I think one of the reasons is because sound is invisible. And like many of the powerful forces in our lives, like gravity, you can't see it. And uh, we live in a very and an increasingly visually biased world. So uh, we often, I mean, you know, pe people just don't recognize and appreciate what an important part sound has uh, in our lives, in our world, and, and what makes us us. And the book, the book is my love letter to sound. If you look at um, our the, the home page of our website, Brain Vaults, you'll see that we study we study uh, music and bilingualism, aging, uh, language, reading, concussion, uh, hearing a noise, autism, uh, and 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 you know you might look at that and think, what are they doing at Brain Vaults? But really, the overarching umbrella is sound and the brain and you can just just by looking at that list that 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 all those different topics you can see how many aspects of our lives sound is a powerful powerful part of and indeed we don't recognize it now one of the things you talk about in the beginning of the book is just the mechanism of sound and you know i i know i have an eardrum and I know, I know there's a couple of other things in there, but in a, you know, a, a doctor's office where there's a model of the ear and you go, oh, well, there's a lot of going on there. Uh, it's kind of extraordinary. We're not going to go into it in depth, but um, the part that I thought was particularly interesting is that um, the brain moves very quickly and it has to convert moving molecules of air pressure into electric signals. Kind of extraordinary. Yeah, no, it's 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 marvelous, and you know the the hope the process fills me with awe, and so the first part of the book, and it's it's just it's the first third, and it's called how sound works, and I I I feel like a little kid sometimes, you know how little kids like to read the same book again and again and again, yeah. they want, want to hear the same story, and you know I have heard I have told the story of sound how sound works. Um, from a biological standpoint, many, many times, and I want to hear it again. I want to hear it again <laughs> and again and again. But, you know, basically, uh, it is, sound is the movement of air. And we have sound waves and we have brain waves. And the sound waves are air and the brain waves are electricity. And electricity is the currency of the nervous system. So uh, th this transformation needs to happen. Um, and so much of what happens, not only uh, it, it, it enters the ear, but it's really the brain that makes a lot of sense of the sound. But now if we just think about, so what makes up sound? You know, again, you know, visually, nobody has difficulty. I've got this visual object and it's got a, a shape, a size, a weight, a, a, a color, texture. Uh, it has ingredients. Well, sound, if you even 
pay attention to sound at all. Sound also is rich with ingredients. It has pitch, timbre, harmonics, phase, how loud it is. There are many, many how, how fast, there's so many timing, rhythmic cues. Um, and the brain, our sonic brain, our sound mind, our hearing brain needs to make sense of all of these ingredients. And one of the metaphors that I use in the book is a mixing board. So, you know, there are all of these different ingredients and in sound. And if you think of the faders of a mixing board going up and down and each fader um, being uh, uh, reflecting the brain's processing of one of these ingredients, we can see how good a job our brain is doing at processing these different ingredients and in sound. And not only do, does this processing occur um, in, 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 very, um, in a very interactive manner, but it matters what our life in sound has been. So these faders really reflect who we are in terms of our life in sound. Now, we tend not to think that, right? We tend to think, well, I, we all heard the same sound, so it's the same. But, of course, we also think we see the same thing, and, of course, we don't. Our brain is constantly interpreting what we see and literally editing things out, and that's true in, sa in sound as well, as I learned from this book. Uh, we know that very directly because people say, aren't you listening? And you go, what do you mean? Uh, what? <laughs> and, of course, your ears were taking in the sound, but your brain decided to just kind of not take it in. One of the examples of this that I thought was so uh, extraordinary, it's a very small thing, but I loved it, is the difference between Bill with a B as in boy and Pill with a P. And they're the same. Your mouth's doing the same thing. What's the difference between Bill and Pill that allows you to hear that difference? It's timing. So timing is uh, you know, one of my favorite and, and, and also uh, important ingredients, the difference between bill and pill is uh, the amount of time that it takes uh, between the uh, onset of uh, the, the, the movement of the mouth and then the uh, uh, vocalization. So bill, pill, uh, it's it's a it's a thirty millisecond timing difference that even though the motions that you're making are the same, there is a, a very very clear acoustic difference. You know, if, if you're a, a signals man like me, and and you you measure um, these these brain responses, you can see as clear as day that um, you know there there's a, a thirty millisecond timing difference between the onset of the voice. In bill and in pill. So B and P, I'm trying to say P carefully not to pop my mic, my microphone, B and P are not really a vocalization. We have to get to the I, the ill, and the B, and the B, which are the B and the P there. Uh, after the P, I make a tiny unconscious hesitation when I want to say the letter P, correct? Yeah, and, and then there are languages like in Hindi, for example, and uh, – Armenian, um, there is something called pre-voiced. So you voice mm, p, mm, b, uh, and that's something that our uh, English-speaking ear or brain um, does not pick up. Be and we, we can be trained to hear those differences. But, you know, again, a, a beautiful example, I think, of how our sound mind is a, a product of our experience is, you know, when we're born, babies can, they're citizens of all the world's languages. They can hear any, any of the sounds, but based on what is meaningful to us. So, you know, if, if we grow up in uh, speaking a language where pre-voicing is meaningful or in Mandarin where these, uh, tone changes within a syllable are meaningful, well then, you know, our brain is going to change fundamentally to the point that when we're asleep and you measure the brain's response to these vocalizations, to these particular sounds, if these, if, if you're, if just depending on who you are, if you're, if you have made 
uh, repeated sound to meaning connections with certain sounds in your sleep, your brain will respond to that. And it won't if you are presented with sounds that uh, you haven't learned to make any kind of a meaningful association with. So I'm living in Israel right now, lived here, moved here four months ago. I came here with a, a rudimentary Hebrew uh, vocabulary and, and a little, and I can read the Hebrew uh, letters. And uh, Hebrew is a very impossible language, but of course I'm 67 and many languages would be hard for me. Now, French would be a little easier uh, or Spanish. I know them each a little bit, but Hebrew, of course, is not from the same root as, as English. But of course, in my mind, well, English is easy because because I know it. And Hebrew is hard because it's not like English. And I was um, fascinated by this uh, data point you gave us that there are 40 or so sounds in English. 40. That's I assume a sound is e, e, e. Uh, uh, there's no, uh, my name in Hebrew is Russ. There's no uh in Hebrew. So people have trouble with my name. Um, I happen to have a Hebrew name as, as, as a Jew, which is Ruvain, Ruvain, uh, which they're very good at, but they're not so good at Russ. And so there's 40 sounds in English, and those are represented by a mere 1,120 different letter combinations, uh, according to your book, as opposed to Italian, which has 25 sounds and 33 different letters. So English has 40-ish roughly times more combinations of letters to yield those sounds. And that must be – it's unimaginable that people come to America from a foreign country and learn English. It's such a hard language. Yeah, but in fact, you know, we, we our sound mind, our hearing brain is is so miraculous in that it can we learn how to make sense of these sounds. And and what you know, one of the stories in my book is the owl story that is relevant, I think, to what you're saying about being an older person and starting to learn a language later in life. And, you know, one of the, the things that you can do in an animal model is go directly and, and, and measure electrical activity from individual neurons. And you can see, okay, so, you know, owls are nocturnal predators, and so they really depend on sound. And, uh, you know, they, they found that you can change the owl's um, auditory and visual fields uh, and, and you can actually see it reflected in the mapping of the neural activity in the brain. And they saw this, you know, initially in younger animals, and they were wondering, well, is this something that um, an older animal can do? And the first experiment that they did, uh, they found, no, in fact, the older, you know, the older animal couldn't learn uh, a new auditory visual space, what they, they do with these owls is they put um, psychedelic prisms on them and then kind of that shift the, the, uh, the visual field to the right or to the left. And so you have to, you know, learn to make new associations. Um, but then the scientists had an idea and they said, well, maybe the older animals just are learning in a different way. And so they used a different strategy. And what they did is they made the changes in the visual fields and in the auditory visual connections smaller. And over the same amount of time, it took the younger animals to learn this new task and for their brain to get rewired in a way that you could physically measure it and see it, the older animals could do that too. So that's telling us, A of all, the older brain, and we know this just from so many, so much converging evidence, the older brain, our brain, is malleable until we die. And, of course, we're different now than we were when we were four or five years old or two or three. And so maybe we need a different uh, strategy for, for learning. And, you know, that's, that's fascinating to me. I guess that's that's a little bit of a comfort. Um, I am I am my my wife is is studying daily her Hebrew. I don't have time unfortunately, but she goes to what's called an ulpan, where you study Hebrew. You start learning three hours a day, and then she has homework and she studies grammar and everything. And my view is that's not going to help me. 
uh, I have to listen and speak. And I'm not going to look, I'm not going to study anything. I'm not going to read charts or read rules. And uh, I don't know if that's going to be true or not. What I do know is that for 10 years, I took uh, French third grade through 12th grade and learned almost nothing. So uh, I'm hopeful, I'm hoping that I can, I can do a little bit um, a, a little bit better here, but you can teach an old owl new tricks, I'm hoping. Well, but also <laughs> you and your wife are different and you hear the brain True. differently. And one of the things that we discovered at Brain Volts is, you know, you, you can take a sound wave and uh, we can listen to it. And then using scalp electrodes, we can measure the electricity that happens in response to sound. So, you know, as I'm talking to you now, the neurons in your brain are producing electricity and we can pick that up. And um, we can determine then that your wife and you and me hearing the same sound uh, mm. is going to, so the sound's the same, but the brain response is going to be different. And you can see it in the um, electrical waveform we can even hear it because you can sonify the uh, electrical signal and you can hear that your brain and your wife's brain are hearing the same sound differently. And so you're also going to learn. Your, your way of learning through sound is going to be very different. Um, I, can't, I can't help but add that George Steiner, the essayist and, and writer, has written a very, an extraordinary book called After Babel. Reference to the Tower of Babel in different languages, where he argues that all language is translation. So you say, you know, we, you and I process the sound differently, of course, as you point out, but the words mean different things to us too, and we think we understand. We understand that we don't understand Shakespeare very well, but we think we understand Jane Austen because she's a uses modern English, but Steiner shows that. Actually, the words have evolved since then, and what you hear versus a contemporary verse, not the same thing. Um, the thing I really liked about the owls in your book is that that an owl tell, – tell the example about the football field. That just blew me away. Oh, well, just, you know, an, an owl and, – and I, I'm not remembering exactly what the um, – you know, owls are, are just re remarkable. And, 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 you know, this is, again, this gets to a philosophical issue of, you know, we, we often think philosophically in terms of um, them and us. So, you know, us being humans and them being animals and plants. And plants and animals have extraordinary, extraordinary abilities that we're, we're just beginning to understand a little bit, but to put that in context with, with, with the owl, um, you know, I, I can be on, on, on two, at one end of a football field and you can be at the other and can snap my finger on one hand and the other hand and the owl can resolve that difference, that spatial difference. It's a phase difference um, very, very well. We certainly so could, couldn't. So the owl's 100 yards away, and I snap my fingers on my right hand, and the owl knows it's my right hand, not my left hand, not by seeing it. Even wearing the goggles, the owl's not going to be able to cheat, but it's going to know from – its eyes going to move toward the hand that snapped. Absolutely. As opposed – which is – I just you know, last – a few weeks ago, we had an episode about dogs' ability to smell. I love this one, and I, I just want to mention there's a Robert Penn Warren uh, poem called The Heart of the Backlog, which has the, a very – powerful and dark reference to uh, Al's hearing, and we'll uh, put a link up to that. Um, let's talk about songbirds, because we're on birds. Uh, oh, this one, I just want to be clear, it's only a small part of the book on Al's, about a page and a half. There is a chapter on songbirds toward the end, but it was one of my favorite chapters. Why, why, should, why does a person, an auditory neuroscientist, care about songbirds? Well, first of all, they're beautiful. They're beautiful to listen to. And uh, historically, people have um, listened for, sound, for, for, for birds to uh, determine where to settle. Because it turns out that um, places that are friendly to birds and to the survival of birds are often also friendly to humans. So this has been uh, a force that has been driving us. Um, birds are fascinating from 
a number of standpoints, you know, and, and again, we're, we, it, it, they help us understand um, human hearing because, um, you know, we're, we're able, again, to, to, to do various experiments with a bird that you can't do with a human. Um, you know, for example, I mean, what we do know is that birds learn their song, they, they learn their songs um, from a tutor from their father. And you, know, you, you also need to know that, that with birds, it's the males that sing and it's the females that choose. So the male bird learns his song from his father. And, you know, there are all kinds of things that you can get into in terms of dialects and, you know, and, and what the, the lady bird is going to, uh, you know, prefer the the, the bird with the closest dialect, uh, she's also going to prefer the, the, the song that is most intricate, that has some nice improvisations, but that, that there's strength there because it's, it's really a, a, a measure of fitness. And I also want to say that, um, you know, part of our research uh, has been looking at, at sex differences in hearing. And there are some um, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting to see this in, in, in the animal kingdom because, you know, the bird, the, the male bird has a different job than the female bird. So, so the way that a bird learns from his daddy is that he imitates. He imitates the song. And there are not very many species that imitate, and humans are one of them. Um, chimpanzees don't. I mean, people have tried, you know, to get them to voc vocally imitate. You know, your dog um, can understand if you want to go outside, he'll understand certain words. Um, but if you, you know, if you're talking to your kid and you're saying going outside, you know, the kid will say outside. And, you know, your, your dog is never going to, to do that. And this uh, has to do with the fact that... Um, that, that birds are vocal learners, we humans are vocal learners, and it seems to be also um, attached to a very fundamental thing that humans do, which is, and birds, um, is that we're very uh, sensitive to rhythms in sound. Uh, a, a human, you know, a baby will move in sync with the beat of a, of a song, um, and certain bird songs, certain birds, will also move in the same way. But again, your dog, you know, your dog is not going to be wagging his tail in time with the beat. So the fact is, and this, you know, brings me to this, this issue of reciprocity and, uh, you know, betweenness, as, as McGilchrist talks about it, you know, this idea of, of back and forth of, of the, what you're hearing and what you're perceiving receiving and then you're adjusting what you're saying and your movements and what you're thinking, you know, in, 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 in the present um, to, um, to, to interact beautifully with your environment. And so birds give us a, a, a glimpse of this because they are one of few species that are vocal learners. They know how to imitate and they can move rhythmically. It's really beautiful, and I, I really love the idea of the – I mean, I find I find birdsong, especially in the morning, very emotionally powerful. And I don't know – I love the idea that it could be part of my evolutionary, you know, past. And I think that that it, it's – that it it's comforting is the word I would use, right? The idea that it's tied to a friendly, fertile environment that – that we evolved to to appreciate that is is, is a fascinating idea, and um, I, it, it also reminds me though that I, you know I think it's part of my childhood, and so it, it doesn't just evoke maybe my evolutionary past. It, it it maybe evokes a time when I was a young boy, and um, I had a certain feeling about waking up and being excited, and the the bird song taps into that somewhat in the way that. The music from my childhood has a certain comforting uh, and and belovedness to it that you know I think often that that we love the music we grew up with not because it was particularly good it just happened to be the the soundtrack of our lives at that point uh, and it's not obvious to me that the music that baby boomers grew up with like me is going to still be popular in fifty years because people then will have grown up with different things but that bird song idea. Um, 
it, it, and the the rise and fall of it, the melodic part of it, the rhythmical part. It's really a it's it's a musical element to life that I think we often don't notice, and I really appreciated noticing it in your book. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think that you know one of the things that we may have um, noticed when the um, you know when we were in lockdown is that uh, you know we, we were noticing the birds not only because. Um, there was less noise, but actually people who measured these responses from birds found that the birds were singing more quietly. Hmm. The birds were singing more quietly because, you know, birds have to scream to be heard over the noise. So they were not only singing more quietly, but they were singing more intricate songs, you know, intricate in terms of pitch and timing and timbre, mm. the, the things that, that excite the lady birds. Um, they, they had the energy to do that because they weren't shouting above the din. Well, we understand that because of what you identify as the cocktail party effect. So if I'm at a cocktail party and, and we're yelling because it's a noisy room and the acoustics of the room or a restaurant, which happens, it, it totally changes the range of things you can communicate um, because you've got to be loud. Period. You can't be you can't be quiet. Um, talk about that challenge for our hearing system. Yeah, the, and, and the and, listening part of it. Yeah, and you can't be nuanced either because you know there is so much nuance in the sound. You know, like I, I started the the episode. You know, you welcomed me to Econ Talk, and and I know you could hear from the sound of my voice that I was happy to be there. And so there is there is this nuance that you would completely lose in a noisy room where you're just trying to get the message across. And again, I, I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think that people notice and realize how important this is. And, and, you know, again, part of my, my book is really trying to get people to realize that, that, that this is important, that, you know, communication and connection is important. And, um, so that, that we should, we should honor it. Um, but we learn throughout our lives. So for example, um, you know, you, you talked about memory and memories for songs. Well, in a noisy place, you will be able to hear your wife better than a stranger because you, you know, you, you know something about the rhythm of her voice and uh, you can pick up cues that, that you have, you've just learned. And you know, it, you know, when you're in a room, depending on the music that's playing, um, it will affect you or not. But we, you know, we learn because we, you know, the sound enters our ear um, into our brain and there we have this um, this confluence, this engagement of what we uh, call the, the efferent system, which is more massive than the pathways that are going upstairs from the ear to the brain. And with evolution, these are more and more evolved. And with our life and sound, um, our hearing, our actual hearing is sculpted not only by the sounds, but what is happening at the same time. So how we are moving. How, what we are thinking about, what we are feeling, and the information from our other senses. Again, this philosophically has to do with a binding problem. And when you look at, at the sonic mind, when you look at the sound mind, the, the hearing brain, you see that, that these operations are this – is, this is a reverberating circuit. And, you know, scientists like to compartmentalize, um, but – you know, this is a, um, a, a a distributed but very interactive process. It's a broad – it's an incredible network, which I started to appreciate, you know, from reading your book. The, the challenge of hearing multiple voices at the same time and only listening to one of them is quite an achievement, right? That's what – isn't that what the – with the background noise going to? Yes, it, it is an achievement. Um, because, but again, we, we need to, we need to learn what to pay attention to and we need to learn what to ignore. So again, um, you know, if you are a speaker of multiple languages, turns out you're particularly good at, they call it inhibitory control. 
that you're pretty good at ignoring uh, information and sounds that are irrelevant so that um, you know th that particular part of your of your sound mind is going to affect how you hear a noise. That's um, amazing. What, what's the McGurk effect, and and what is it? Why is it important? Well, the McGurk effect is is um, it, it it just shows that our uh, visual and auditory information uh, affect each other, and it's it's a very obvious. Uh, demonstration. I do this in my classroom all the time. I'll have, you know, I'll ask somebody to just be saying the same sound like ba, 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 and they are going to time it with the movement of my lips. And uh, so I will be in front of the class and I will make the ba, ba, ba movement. And then every now and then I will uh, make my mouth go in a position like, like for fa. So, you know, they're either seeing or so they're seeing two different things. Um, and as they see these two different things, they actually hear different things. So I'll ask them, you know, well, what, you know, what did you hear? And, you know, people will say, well, there were some ba's and some fa's and some va's. Um, but so that the, the, the visual information clearly affects how we hear the sound. But you weren't making any noise you're just making no, the face I'm just and they making were hearing the face. someone they can't see make make just ba but they would hear fa even though right that's that's what happened right that's it's exactly incredible. what happened yep let's um let's talk about noise uh for a little bit maybe for a lot i i uh as i get older uh, i find noise more um annoying meaning things i'm hearing i don't want to hear particularly you talk about the phenomenon where a truck will be uh, idling on the street it's incredibly loud by the way and we don't you know we're walking along and and then it'll stop it might be idling outside your window it stops and all of a sudden you give a sigh of relief you write and like oh right that you weren't hearing it but you were it was going in um i think about it with uh, leaf blowers when i lived in suburban maryland uh any afternoon in the fall was uh it's they're so loud and it i found it it does. It starts to affect more than just that's a loud noise. It starts to make you feel not so, not feel so well. I don't mean sick, but it just it it jars on you. But the example you you shared with me in an email I want to focus on is is beeping trucks, which I also find hard to listen to these days. As I, and especially as I get older, part of it's because it's just beeping. Part of it's it's a really loud beep, in a good cause, keep people from being run over is the idea. But talk to me about beeping trucks. Yeah. Well. Um, you know, beeping trucks are um, there are there, there are so many times when you know does every does every truck that backs up every um, uh, every little van many cars have this you know um, and and I really it, it's it's not so much a matter of of the beeping trucks as much as the 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 whole idea of a soundscape and what we are so cavalier about. So I want to make the distinction between um, dangerous sounds to our ears, so the sounds that are loud enough that will uh, create hearing loss, and everyone knows about that. But I'm really talking about, you know, you're talking about the leaf blower that you can hear three blocks away and you know it 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 excites us in a, a not so good manner and why does it excite us it's because sound is is you know one of our our most evolutionarily ancient senses and sound cues us about um you know, is, is this sound going to eat me? Can I eat it? Can I mate with it? You know, these are, are very deeply ingrained um, parts of our survival. And, and, you know, we've all had that experience even in, in the night where you, you, you hear a sound and, 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 and you're, you're jarred by it. And then, and then you realize, oh, yes, this is a familiar, uh, the, the sump pump turning on or, or something that, 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 that you know. Um, so... You know, we 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 learn about this, but I think that when we we don't even notice it, you know, again, like when I'm, I'm in the kitchen and and suddenly the refrigerator turns off, and and 
I, I didn't know it was on. And I'll breathe this sigh of, of relief um, because I think that part of what disconnects us as a society and, um, you know, is, is um, you know, part of, of the, the, the depression and mental illness that, that you know, you had a, in, in, in the Lost Connections um, book, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, we... Um, we, we just are in a constant state of alarm. We don't know it, but we are in this constant state of alarm and tension. And, you know, it's, we've, it's just happened. You know, I mean, noise is just a byproduct of our industrial society and nobody has really thought about it. And so what I'm hoping is that, you know, with this book, people will think about how important, how deeply important sound is so that we as a society can make better choices so you know to help us not be in such a a state of tension and an alarm because our our ancient evolution is has primed us to be really aware of sound whether we're consciously aware of it or not our brain knows it's a really deep idea. I think you know it's the flip side of the song of the songbird. Right? The songbird you don't listen to. You don't. You might not be paying attention, but it's it's comforting you because it's tapping into something deep in your brain. The the leaf blower and the beeping truck is agitating you without you realizing it. And that sigh of relief when the noise uh, dissipates or disappears is a measure of uh, of how agitated you were without your conscious knowledge. And you know, it's a beautiful example of the Coase theorem. This idea that we interact with each other in intricate and and responsive ways. So, if you have beeping trucks, you don't have to spend so much time worrying about trucks backing up when you're walking in an urban environment. I live in an urban environment now, and a beeping truck is going to, besides agitate me when I'm not that close to it. If I am close to it, it's going to make me jump, and I know that it's going to protect me. If the trucks didn't beep. The world would be quieter, and you might say, yeah, but more people are going to run over. Well, maybe, but you'll also have more people paying attention when they're walking, for better or for worse. And that's the Coase insight that, that it takes two to tango, that things that affect one person yield a response that isn't just the fact that the noise is there or that you can be careful. It changes your behavior, and I think um, – I wish, I wish my neighborhood was a little quieter. We, yeah. we have a um, – you know, we have a. I always wonder if there's a person outside uh, who decides to go through my garbage, empty it, and then put it back in. It's actually just the garbage truck picking up the, the 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 can. But that's an unbelievably loud noise in most urban environments. The garbage truck has all this internal uh, me mechanisms to to crush the garbage, and it's at four thirty, five thirty in the morning where I'm living now. He's out. I'm glad he picks up my garbage, by the way. I'm really glad. Yeah. But yeah. it is a um, – it sometimes wakes me up, and it's – I wake up with anxiety. So it is yeah. weird. It's yeah. a great, great insight. Yeah, yeah. But, but Russ, um, you know, so you, you talk about beeping trucks and the two sides of it, right? Uh, and, and my students are always furious with me because, you know, they, they always want to have the answer. Yeah, of course. Um, and, 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 you know, th my answer is generally it depends. Yeah, and so you're what trained I'm, like I'm, an economist. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, you know, wanting people. If if you're aware of sound, then you can you can do certain things. To um, to, to, to you have some control over your own sonic environment, and you can help in making decisions uh, for our, our classrooms. It it actually, I mean, we know that it is harder for kids to learn in a noisier place. Um, you know, again, they can hear the teacher, but they're learning because learning is disrupted when there is this moderate level, quote, safe noise, safe level of noise, but it has a deep effect on us. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I am hoping that, and, and I, you know, I give many, many examples in the book that people can think about with respect to their own lives. And I, I like to give personal examples because, you know, again, uh, science, sci science is a deeply human endeavor and it's, it's 
performed by humans, science, a, a book about uh, the biology of, of, of hearing in our lives um, is, is written by a human. And, and, and what is really important, again, and here we talk about the tyranny of metrics, you know, in, in science, we are so um, limited by what we can measure and we often forget um, and we, we don't appreciate all the other forces, you know. So, you know, for example, um, uh, wisdom is one of these things. You know, if, if, if you go to a conference on aging, anything you can measure, like, well, how fast it takes me to put the key in the door. Um, I mean, I'm slower at this than, than I was, you know, when I was balancing a kid and groceries and getting the key in really quickly. So anything you can measure, um, you know, as you get older, it, 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 it gets worse. But you can't measure wisdom, and there is, you know, clearly. I mean, and, and as I say in the aging chapter, I am so happy as an older person, and I, I feel like I understand. Um, I have an appreciation of the world in a way that I, I didn't have before, and and mm-hmm. also with 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 making music, you know, there are so many things that you can't measure, like the, the you know the. The, the self-esteem that a kid gets from, 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 you know, performing on stage and interacting with people he otherwise wouldn't interact with. Yeah, it's also, though, the insecurity that arises from doing a really – giving a horrible recital. I, w- I want to talk a little bit about music because I know it's an incredible passion of yours. Uh, all of our kids, I think, had piano lessons. One may have had a guitar, and none of them stuck with it. <clears throat> they all love music, but none of them stuck with their lessons. I self-taught. I was given no music lessons growing up. I self-taught uh, myself guitar in high school, and it played it for a long time with some some level, various levels of seriousness. And now I hardly, I haven't touched my guitar in forever. But I did bring it with me to Israel, even with not on the. Um, no, it's in the. Sorry, it's in storage. But it's funny. It's in my mind. It's in my the corner of my room. It's not. It's sitting in storage in, in Maryland still because we haven't brought our stuff yet. But uh, I, all our kids got music lessons, and. I think the, it's tempting to say, and I would have said until I read your book, that, okay, I was trying to give them a love of music. Maybe it helped. But I was also kind of enjoying the idea of them having an instrument to play, which is a beautiful thing to have for a, a thousand reasons. And it just didn't work out. But you suggest in your book quite passionately that uh, learning to play an instrument, and you include singing, uh, learning to play an instrument has vast impact beyond – the instrument that sticks with us for a long time. So Absolutely. give us a, give us an overview of that. Yeah. So so good job, Russ. You you did the right thing <laughs> in, in, in giving your kids music lessons because you know often people say, well, you know, I my, my kid is not going to be a, a a professional musician, and 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 in fact, there are very few professional musicians. But we are all yeah. <laughs> musical. We are all musical, and what we learn. Early on, so we, we've done studies across the lifespan, but especially um, in older adults, um, you know, actually when I give a talk, I often ask the audience, you know, how many of you have, have had a music lessons at some time in your life? And every hand goes up and then I ask, well, you know, what about uh, now? And not that many. But the fact is that we have been able to measure in terms of how well, the brain processes the ingredients of sound that are important for language as well as music. If you have early experience or if you have experience really at any time of your life um, playing a musical instrument, making some kind of music, and yes, of course, voice is a wonderful instrument, um, but if you are you know, adjusting the, the, the physical complexities of, um, of, of your body as you're hearing and moving and thinking and remembering, uh, paying attention, uh, coordinating with visual information. And this is so important for so many other activities. But again, objectively, in these older adults, we just simply divided them into people who um, had played a musical instrument at one point in their lives, um, you know, four or five years in band or something like that. And then, you know, it was 40 years between then and uh, when we measured their brain responses and the people who had played a musical instrument earlier in their lives had a sound mind 
that reflected the processing of sound details that are very important and are especially important for what you brought up, Russ, is hearing and noise. And hearing and noise is something that gets, it does get worse. It gets more, dif- it's difficult for everybody, but it gets more difficult as we get older. But being able to, that, you know, that, 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 that history of having played a musical instrument has a legacy. And, you know, again, we can see it objectively in the brain responses, which, you know, I find so beautiful, you know, to be able to think about something as, as complex as communicating in a noisy environment and then to be able to actually see the differences that people's experience with musical education has on the older brain, um, that's, that's, that's remarkable. I agree. I, although I, if I had not read your book and you told me that, uh, I would have said, well, you know, that's, it, it, that could just be what we call selection bias in economics. It's not a random sample. The people who were giving music and st- lessons when they were younger were different, came from different kinds of homes. And that could be true, and I'm sure that would complicate trying to measure it with any precision. But what I want to say is, is that reading your book gave me th- th- the possibility that it could be true. I would have dismissed it. Oh, come on. You mean because I played the violin? But what your book does is illuminate these these connections between – the brain and sound that I just had never thought about. And one of the things you say in there, which I make sure I want to get, make sure I get this right. Uh, many people who cannot see have unusually um, uh, developed hearing and musical ability. And I always thought, okay, it's a sort of a compensation, just, you know, a different draw from the urn. And again, there's a selection bias. We happen to, we know about Stevie Wonder because he writes amazing songs and he's incredibly talented. So, uh, of course, it makes us maybe think that that some people who have missed one sense get an extra sense in the other. But what you show in the book, if, tell me if I got this right, that that the brain changes if you can't see. Once you can't see, the parts of your brain that were used for sight now get gobbled up by sound. And, and there's sort of this imperialist thing going on there. Is that is that the do I understand I, you, that correctly? You are so correct, and it it fills me with 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 relief and gratitude <laughs> that, that 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 you got this from the book because um, this is why it matters what we do. You know, we have a responsibility for how we spend our life in sound. We have a responsibility for our children for our educational system, for our um, city planning. Um, you know, we, we have a responsibility and the reason or a really, the reason that I as a, as, a, as a biologist can talk about easily and with strength is that our experience with sound changes our brain. It changes biologically who we are because, you know, we are our memories and our memories are very much what we hear, what we have heard. Um, and so, you know, we and our children um, are, 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 are shaped by our life in sound and this is important, yes, because it shapes, it changes our brain. So we have, this is a call to action. You know, we, we, act, we have a responsibility to ourselves and others to give this a think. Well, to give your book uh, probably the highest praise I can, I, again, if you haven't read the book and, I'm, and you're listening to Nina, you might think, someone's crazy, you know? I mean, like, sounds nice and... It's great to hear, and I'm glad I'm not deaf, and blah, blah, blah. But the book really does make an interesting and and persuasive argument that sound is more than just hearing. And I think that's the simplest way to get someone interested in these ideas because all my life I've thought, well, sound is hearing. I'll give you an example, actually, that you talk about in the book and let you um, give me a hard time. Um, I mentioned earlier that my left ear is not quite great. I think it was damaged during a time when there was construction outside my office and when I was a professor and a normal professor anyway. And I 
put in headphones and cranked up music really loudly for months to be able to work above the din of the noise. So I heard a different kind of noise that I liked. And I think I damaged my hearing in that period. It could have been I got a cold. I don't know what it was. But anyway, my left ear doesn't work very well. So, and my right ear is okay, but it's not, you know, it's not what it was. So I have to ask my wife to repeat stuff, which is cruel. And we live in an apartment now that has really high ceilings and it's really echoey and it's hard to hear for me. And uh, so I thought about getting a hearing aid, you know. So I go to the doctor and uh, he says, you know, hear, hearing loss is bad for your brain. And he said people who have hearing loss and don't get hearing aids are, are, have less brain function. And I wanted to say to, I didn't say, I don't think I said this. I wanted to say, do you know who you're talking to? Like, you're talking to the wrong guy. Like, you know, I know about correlation and causation. And the fact that there's this correlation between people with, you know, hearing loss and some imperfect brain function is really complicated by income and all kinds of things. So the people who choose to get hearing aids are not a random sample, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm comforting myself with this for why. Uh, I didn't get that hearing aid, and I still don't have it. But after I read your book, I'm thinking about it. And the reason is, is that you make the case in the book. Oh, you know, the, he also told me, you know, when you can't hear, you feel left out. And I said, I get that. I'm not at that point yet. And I understand that if you don't talk to anybody because you can't hear them, and they they don't want to talk to you because you're annoying because you can never hear them. Yes, you get isolated, and that affects you. But he was trying to make this case, the, this seemingly silly case that it's going to affect your brain just not having your hearing by itself. Yeah. But you make that argument, and uh, it's giving me pause. So what's yeah. why is that connected? Well, I mean, that it's actually very much at the core of, of the book, of the sound mind. The sound mind um, engages how what we hear, how we think. So how we think, our cognitive skills, our, our memory, and our attention – how we move, how we combine information from other senses, and how we hear. Now, we know this from a biological perspective because we can measure uh, the activity of, 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 of neurons um, in response to sounds that uh, you know, a, a person has a, a certain feeling about compared to uh, one that, that, that they don't. Or, I mean, you know, there are so many. So one of the things that, that, that you know, Russ, is that um, 20% of the book is references. Hmm. So, you know, for anybody out there who's listening and saying, oh, she's just saying, um, there, there is a lot of science and a lot of converging evidence that um, I, I, I felt responsible as a, a scientist to put there for anyone who – but even if you don't look at it, just to know, I'm not just saying there are many you – know, we, we, we know this from a biological perspective. So, yes – um, if you if you don't hear as well, you're not going to be thinking as well for a number of reasons. First of all, because hearing just automatically engages how we think, but also because if you are putting effort into trying to figure out what I'm saying, you are don't have that um, that they call it cognitive reserve to, to 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 be thinking about well, you know, what is she saying uh, from a from from a theoretical standpoint, uh, you know, you're not just trying to get the words. You're trying to actually think about what I'm saying, and you know, your ability to do that um, is 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 diminished. Uh, but isn't that isn't that inconsistent with with the different claim you make? And by the way, I think you know Nina that I don't like the phrase generally studies show, but oh, I would yeah. say that the studies in your book are different. Many of them are different. They're actually. There are things like what happens to this neuron, and I'm sure there are issues about reliability and replicability in this research too, but it's not quite the same as what economists do. And it, it, a lot of it was, I thought, very, was seriously, was very, was very powerful. But when you talked about the effort you have to take to hear when your hearing's imperfect, you'd have to pay attention. And it, it's tiring. Uh, it's physically tiring. You, you struggle. Uh, there's a limit to how long you can do. It's hard to focus, right? In general, it's, it's just always a challenge. And Focusing to hear is challenging, but but I'm thinking about <clears throat> language acquisition. If I speak in Hebrew now uh, with a with a native Hebrew speaker who is 
being nice to me and speaking slowly and correcting me when I'm making a mistake and ask me questions. And we're, and we're going back and forth. It's not just me talking for the time and not just listening, but a, a conversation. It is totally exhausting. It is, I can do it for about an hour is, is an enormous amount of time to do it. And, and yet I think that's actually good for my brain. So how do you reconcile that with the claim that when I'm hard of hearing, it's bad for my brain? So it, it it's going to depend, right? So uh, it, it it it's it's going to be important for you. I mean, anything that that is worth. Um, if, if you're going to change your brain, it is going to take a while to change your brain in in a fundamental way, in the ways that you know that that we can really measure deeply and biologically ways that are you know your brain uh, while you're asleep, while you're awake, that's fundamentally you. And, you know, for example, we found in our studies in, um, in, in, in schools that uh, where we looked at music education, that we didn't find changes after a year of music making, that it took two years. So, we're, you know, we're really talking about ways in which you fundamentally change how you intersect with the world. So if you are constantly now on a daily basis in sort of a dulled relationship with the world, your brain is going to change to the point that, you know, with, with before you had the, the hearing loss, um, your brain uh, would hear different elements in sound that would automatically help you think and remember and feel um, in, in, in ways that, um, that, that you weren't even aware of. But I think, I think there's also a weirder piece to this, which is I think being thrown into a, a language environment that is not your native tongue and being thrown into an environment where you can't fully hear uh, and you struggle to – are very similar, right? Yeah. And what I've noticed, and I think this is a, maybe a different way to say what you're saying. What I've noticed is that – my joke is that when I hear a, a serious native Israeli speaking at full speed, Israelis speak very, very quickly. I think even for native Israelis, I think they, they, they speak quickly. And my joke is it's like the bar scene in Star Wars, to me, you know, it's like it's just yeah. it's just a bunch of noise. It's noise, yeah. and and yeah. and my first, and I might recognize one word, and I'm going to struggle to separate the words because the spaces aren't there. And in, as a when you're speaking your native tongue, the spaces are all contextual. You know exactly where they are. You know what the words are. You don't get confused. We're just hearing this foreign language, and what I've noticed is that if I'm not careful. My brain just shuts down. It's something I noticed in my father uh, before he passed away when his hearing was really deteriorating, didn't want to wear his hearing aid. I could see it just kind of shut down. And I always thought it was because like he didn't like to hear and failed to hear and and then have to ask. But I think it's worse than that. I think it's just like your self-esteem is down. And that's true as the language learner and as the hearing loss person. And you just want to – your brain kind of says, I'm done. Too hard. I'm going to rest. And I'm going to hear it as – just a bunch of random noises like like the creatures in the bar i don't know that's the way i feel sometimes yeah but but but, <laughs> but 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 russ you are tuning your sound mind and i really encourage you to learn another language because it takes effort you know this is something that will take years but it's a good kind of effort you know to be putting in this kind of effort you're what the result is, you are tuning your sound mind. If you are putting a lot of effort into trying to hear um, without a hearing aid when you need one, you are dulling your sound mind because you're, you know, you're not thinking and engaging, and you know, you, you're you're not as um, as 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 uh, biologically engaged. So. You know, again, uh, it 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 depends, 
Um, and and I, I would really encourage you, you know, as I encourage, you know, I, I think that educationally, learning another language, of course, you know, gives us a lot of perspective in, in many ways, but certainly from a sound standpoint. But uh, as you continue to become more familiar with this language, which is around you, how wonderful. And you have this, this opportunity right, right there yeah, to strengthen so- your sound mind. Yeah. And when it happens, when it works, when I, like I hear a whole sentence, I get so mm-hmm. excited. So it is, it's very, you do get a nice uh, rush of thrill. Um, you mentioned in passing, uh, and I don't think you said much about it, but you mentioned in passing that the brain is not like a computer. The computer, brain is computer is a very popular metaphor. And I've mentioned on the program before, <clears throat> I think I got it from a former, a past econ talk guest, uh, Daniel Botkin. In one of his books, he traces the history of how we conceive of nature as a certain whatever the most advanced machine is. That's our model for that's our metaphor, you know. And and I think that's very much our nature, or the way we look at the brain. You know, the brain's like a clock, and then then it's and then now it's like a computer. I think, and I personally, my suspicion is it's not. But I'm curious why you you say that. Yeah, I I think it is so wrong to think about the brain as a computer because it isn't a computer. Our brain works nothing like a computer. You know, think, think about our, our daily life, you know, when, when <laughs> that, that, that is so run, not by humans, but by bots where you, you know, you, you make a phone call and you have to uh, say, you know, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? Because that's the way a computer works. And, uh, you know, whereas a human being, you know, you could tell them in, in, in a second, you know, I, I want to know, know how to make my African violets grow. And, you know, they'll know exactly where to send you so that you're not spending hours doing that. Um, you know, chess is often this example, you know, where, where computers will, will go through it, billions of, of, of possibilities because that's how computers work. A person who understands chess is going to maybe think of eight moves. And again, just figure out what is the best move in the moment to, uh, to make. So um, fundamentally, it, well, the, 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 brain, the brain is not a machine. It is a, um, an, a, an intricate biological system that is... Um, responsive in so many ways that we know about, but mostly all of the different ways we don't know about, all the, the, the bacteria and RNA that are in our cells that we, you know, think that, that, that run our, our um, you know, what we think is, is heredity. Uh, you know, we, there, there are so many factors in our, uh, in, in our biology that as, you know, as, as biologists, um, I mean, I, I love being a biologist because, um, you know, we know a couple of things and it's exciting to talk about these few things that we know, but I think it's really important to say we don't know, we don't know how this works um, because it is so, as you would say, glorious. You like mm-hmm. that? I do. Um, and, and it is glorious uh, and, and, and there's so much there to understand and we, we know how computers work. Yeah, if if you if you that's that's a great point by the way in and of itself, right? If you say the brain is a is a computer, it's strange that we don't understand it because we really understand computers really well. Um, it's, that's a fascinating, uh, simple observation. Um, do you think most neuroscientists agree with you? No. That's the 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 consent. The mainstream view right now is that the brain quote is like is some kind of well. You know, I think that there's got on off. It's got on off switches. Yeah, and 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 also that we can see things. So imaging is so. And everybody thinks that 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 not everybody, you know. But but there 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 is a view that if you can see what part of the brain is active or lights up, that that somehow tells us something. I mean, you know, it gives us, yes, it gives us some information in the converging evidence larger picture, but people um, so often have this sense that there is an answer. Uh, oh, this part of the brain um, is active. And and by the way, with, with imaging, it isn't even neural activity. You know, you're measuring blood flow. Um, 
and and this part of the brain is is active and so oh so now we understand you know what happens when we meditate come on um, anyway, that's 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 my view, and 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 also, um, you know, and one of the reasons that, that at least in terms of my essay, I like to look at physiology, which is, um, you know, it's, it's it 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 gives you a, a different kind of 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 information. Again, it has its own limitations, um, but I I think that um, scientists often are drawn by uh, a modular and a visually biased view of, um, of, of how the brain works. And um, that's, that, that's really not my view. And, and it, it's a view actually, you know, if you think of the National Institutes of Health, there was a National Institute on Vision 13 years before there was one on hearing. But just the fact that we have these National Institutes of different individual fields um, is uh, it's it's helpful in some ways, but really, and again, as a biologist, I really think that truth, the capital T, is um, when we get into the intersection of 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 fields, you know, including very much including philosophy. Um, but different branches of, of science. And, and this is not the way science really works for the most part. It's not the way study sections work. It's not right. the way, you know, that, that you, you sure. really are, are, are looked at by, um, by, by, by specialists in a, in a particular area. Um, so, you know, again, it's just this, this dance uh, between uh, – understanding the intricacies of the fields that are relevant to a larger perspective. Yeah, and it's a it's a recognition of the organic emergent character of the brain, I think, uh, and therefore the multifaceted, multidisciplined, whatever you want to say about senses in the brain, which again, I didn't fully appreciate until I read your book. Um, it's kind of obvious once you think about it and see it that way, but it's not the way we always organize things. Let's let's close by – I'm going to talk about what I got out of your book, and then I want you to take us home with, with anything you want to add at the end. I, I really do think that most people think of sound and hearing as this standalone thing. It's um, – you know, it's like – you know, if you if – you, um, if you're out in the rain, you get wet, and if they're noises, you hear them. And <laughs> I think that that would that would summarize the way I thought about my sense of hearing and and the role it plays in my life. I love music. I love trying to acquire a second language. Um, I love the lilt of a great poet reading a great reading of poetry or great uh, orator. So there's a lot of things that I like about sound, but the holistic uh, lessons that you provide in the book about how we choose to live. I mean, there's some small ones like you might want to wear earplugs more often. That's a nice – it's a good point um, to keep noise from battering us, battering you in your daily life. But I think the the mix of thinking about music, language, conversation, and how the sense of hearing and the ear interacts with the brain in both directions – is really uh, life changing is a little strong. Obviously, it is for you because it is your life. But I think your attempt to make people aware of these processes and the awe that you have for it and the awe that you were able to convey in the book really is is special. And I, you know, we didn't talk about how we hear in any detail, but that alone is such a, an extraordinary and all that glorious uh, part of being human that I just didn't appreciate. So I, I, I want to thank you for the book. And I think, um, I think it actually will change my life a little bit. Might get the hearing aid, might be more dedicated to my Hebrew lessons, but more importantly, perhaps just more appreciative of how, uh, what it is to be human and have these interactions. So that's my takeaway and you can yeah. finish and yeah. add anything you want. Yeah. So, so Russ, you already know a lot more than you think, you know, in that, 
you know, you, you spend a lot of your life in sound. Hmm. You spend a lot of time interviewing people. Hmm. And this is done through sound. And, you know, maybe you weren't quite aware of that, but this is deep. Sound, sound connects us. It connects us in the moment, in the present. It makes, you know, and, and what, what is so fun and, you know, why I was so, why it's fun to talk with you is I don't have a script. You don't have a script. Um, you know, we are everyday improvisers. And what's exciting is, the, is, is, is where we are connecting and moving together. We are, you know, it's this, this reciprocity, this back and forth that happens through, I mean, sound is one of the, the few, you know, because sound uh, is, is it, it happens and then it, it's gone. But while it's happening, it's happening. It's happening and it's connecting us. And it's really, you know, it's, it's connecting you and me and our, our minds, you know, so that in, in this time where, you know, I think there is uh, increased isolation and depression and divisiveness and alienation, um, you, I think sound, sound connects us. And for that reason, um, we really need to recognize the beauty, the power of sound in our lives. My guest today has been Nina Krauss. You know, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.